Okay, so I think we can start. Again, welcome everyone. My name is Mariangela Pellegrini. I'm the Educational Patient Program Manager for the ERA Neuroblonet, so European Reference Network on Rare Hematological Disease. And I'm very honored to welcome all of you on the last session of this educational program organized by Genomet for All at the ERA Neuroblonet and dedicated to artificial intelligence in hematology and conceived for a public at large. Um, as said, this program has been conceived, planned, designed by the uh, scientific committee of the Genomet for All, the educational committee. And it's, uh, as you can see, it's an European on live and interactive program. So you will have interaction with all of our speakers. And so our objective is to increase awareness in the growing role and growing advances of artificial intelligence in medicine. So meaning diagnosis, treatment, follow-up. And we have also tackled three specific clinical domains of hematology, that is myelodysplastic syndromes, sickle cell disease, and multiple myeloma. As, said, as I've just said, this program is a cycle of four webinars. Today we have at the last, we are at the last session. Each uh, session has been provided by K expert speakers in the field of artificial intelligence and application of uh, the artificial intelligence on rare rheumatological disease. We started on the 13th of September. On the first lecture, we have presented the Genomet for All, the role of precision medicine in hematology. We have presented use case on MDS, sickle, and multiple melioma. Last time we talked on data standardization and linkage, and today we are going to talk about data integration and analysis. But before introducing you the three speakers of today's lecture, I would like to share with you some key roles uh, and home roles. So first of all, as you can see, this session is recorded. So if you don't feel comfortable with that, you can switch off your camera, change your name in the Zoom platform, or just mm, write to me and I will take care for the recording that your name will not appear if you intervene in the Q&A session we will have at the end. And as said, at the end, so um, we will have first the speaker presenting the lecture and the topics. And then at the end, you will have the possibility uh, to raise your hand and ask orally the question or to write the question in the chat. And as you can see, we facilitate the um, interaction with the speaker using Slido. Uh, that is extremely easy to use Q&A and pooling platform for meeting and events. So you can see there is a barcode that is actually displayed in the screen. If um, with your mobile phone, you click on it, you can go directly to the, to the Q&A uh, box and write your question. So we will tackle all your comment, question, feedback, curiosities at the end of the, um, of the presentation. So uh, said so, your microphone will be muted along all the presentation, but feel free at any moment to write your question in the chat. And if you want to intervene orally, that will be at the end, at the end raising your hand. So um, we can finally arrive at the today's lecture, so that integration and analysis. Uh, the three speakers I'm going to present are Tiziana Sanavia, that is assistant professor at the Department of Medical Science in the University of Torino in Italy since 2020. And she has a PhD degree in bioengineer from the University of Padova. Then we will have Patricia Alonso de Apeyanis, that is assistant professor at the University Politecnica de Madrid in Spain since 2022. And she's currently pursuing the PhD degree in deep learning algorithm for medical applications. And finally, we will listen from Gastone Castellani. 
He is full professor at the Bologna University in Applied Physics, Biophysics, and is also the director of the Galvani Center for Bioinformatics, Biophysics, and Biocomplexity. So please, Tiziana, you go first. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction, I'm Maria Angela, and uh, welcome everybody. So I will share my presentation. Can you see it? Yes, perfectly, thank you. Okay. So I will uh, show you, introduce you what uh, we are doing in our uh, research lab uh, when uh, we are talking about uh, disease pro progression uh, prediction. So let's first uh, introduce uh, the topic of today, which is uh, the artificial intelligence. So um, I would like to first point out that the concept of artificial intelligence that is broadly mentioned and that one of machine learning are not the same concepts. They are quite different because artificial intelligence is a very uh, general um, concept that includes all uh, different techniques that uh, tries to mimic uh, the human behavior in order to solve uh, some problems. In the 80s, uh, the machine learning uh, arised. So uh, with the machine learning, uh, we were able uh, to uh, provide uh, some models that are able to learn from data some new rules. So what we, uh, we mean when we say uh, we learn? So in the conventional programming, we were used uh, to provide uh, to the computers uh, the data and uh, some rules uh, that were human created. And uh, we let uh, the computer uh, to uh, find out uh, a desired outcome. In the, uh, in the machine learning, we change our paradigm and we provide the data and what we expect as a desired outcome and we allow the machine to create their own uh, rule through a learning process. So uh, it automatically assess the rules that creates. In order to do to address this task, we have uh, to prepare the data and in our case, the clinical data in a suitable way that can be exploited by the machine learning algorithms. So here uh, you can see an example and we have the information for, from each patient and we distinguish two categories of variables, of clinical variables. On one side, we have the features that are used from the model to build the rule. On the other side, we have what we call the outcome. So for example, a specific clinical event that describes the prognosis of the, the patient. And each outcome has a label. For example, the outcome, the event happen or not. With the machine learning, starting from this data, we can perform a, a plethora of uh, algorithms that can address different tasks for the clinicians. A first approach is called an unsupervised approach, where we observe and learn new patterns from the data, and we allow to um, group the patients according to similar uh, characteristics that we found in the clinical records. Therefore, what we do is a sort of clustering with the, the aim of, of stratifying our cohort of patients. Therefore, what we apply usually are uh, clustering methods and uh, mostly combine with the dimensionality reduction methods that allows us to uh, provide a better description of our features and uh, to assign to the patients new labels that are able to 
uh, group the patients that uh, um, can develop a, a similar prognosis. On the other side, another type of approaches that we are using are the supervised ones. So in the supervised, we provide the features and the outcomes together with the labels. Here, the aim is to try to find out the rules that best uh, identifies those labels and therefore to classify well the patients. In order to address this ta task that we call a prediction, we have to split our data from our cohort of patients in two sets. One of training, where we use the features together with the outcome in order to train the model and find out the best rules. And the other set that is called a test set, where we have the information uh, of the outcome of our patient, but we apply the model that is already trained on the new data using only the features. The model will automatically provide the prediction that will be compared with the known outcomes. And in this way, we are able to assess the performance of, of our model with the aim of making generalizable model in order that if another court is coming from another center, clinical center, with the same uh, prediction task and data, we expect that that model will perform the same uh, performance with the same accuracy. We can then complicate our outcomes. Therefore, we can pass from uh, an outcome that is characterized by a set of, uh, for example, uh, binary um, class classification and uh, to do cross-sectional, we can move uh, towards uh, longitudinal analysis uh, where we associate to the outcome also the time. In this way, we are able to predict uh, at which time uh, a specific event uh, will occur. And this is allowed through survival analysis. That is a crucial tool uh, that aims to predict uh, the time to an event of clinical interest at an individual patient level. In this setup, we will have then the information about the start of our study, for example, the date of, uh, uh, of a diagnosis of a specific disease, and then we will fix an end of our study and we will observe how many patients will develop or not a specific outcome. In this way, we can uh, describe uh, our court uh, by associating uh, what is called the survival probability, therefore the probability at each time of the follow-up, where we can predict uh, how many patients will develop a specific outcome. The basic uh, statistical approach uh, is the Cox regression model uh, that allows a linear combination of the features. Therefore, uh, what we do is uh, summing uh, all the features uh, that we want to include uh, to our model, and each feature is modulated by a weight uh, that is uh, uh, predicted by the model in order to uh, have a combination that, that uh, uh, achieves uh, the best performance. In the last year, uh, there was a further development in machine learning methods. Therefore, from the plethora of uh, methods available from machine learning, uh, neural networks and now deep learning methods uh, are, uh, are showing uh, better uh, performance in, in terms of uh, uh, accuracy of the results uh, and uh, another uh, um, main uh, advantage of these uh, methods is uh, to achieve uh, a better representation of our feature by allowing also non-linear uh, interaction among uh, the features. So by combining them, uh, it is possible to test new algorithms 
starting from uh, uh, around 2018, uh, these new algorithms uh, are available uh, for uh, making uh, this type of prediction of the prognosis. So a first application, uh, we already tested this uh, algorithm uh, to the use case of a myelodysplastic uh, uh, syndrome where we have uh, a cohort of more than 2,000 patients uh, and uh, we consider three types of events, the overall uh, leukemia-free and event-free survival. In addition, uh, we are moving towards uh, a single uh, machine learning uh, application uh, using cl only clinical data towards a multimodal approach uh, where we try to combine uh, multiple uh, different information uh, from the patients. In this case, uh, for uh, MDS, uh, we try to integrate uh, clinical demographic, uh, cytogenetics and genetics data. Of course, uh, this, uh, um, this uh, task is uh, more challenging for us because uh, we have uh, to deal uh, with high dimensional and uh, quite heterogeneous data that uh, can contain uh, several missing information. So here we try to test uh, uh, this data and compare them to the classical approaches, uh, also using different integration strategies. So we start by integrating demographic and clinical variables, then adding the genetic information, and then we try to uh, substitute the genetic information with a more compact uh, representation through scores or clustering approaches that are able to compress the data. Here is uh, the preliminary, um, these are the preliminary results that we obtain by our assessment. In the y-axis, you can see the concourse, concordance index. Uh, the higher it is, uh, the better uh, the, the, the model performs. And uh, we can notice uh, uh, three um, characteristics of these results. The first take-home message uh, is that we need the genomic data since using only demographic and clinical data uh, reduce uh, the, uh, the performance of the models, of all the models. If uh, we focus on the linear approaches, uh, we can see that uh, using the data as they are, uh, they are not enough. So we need uh, to uh, pre-process the data by compressing the genetic information in order to increase the performance. On the other side, for the non-linear approaches, the machine learning based approaches, we can see that this uh, uh, step that is uh, um, it's a high level pre-processing that requires time in order to find out the best compression is not necessarily required since the performance are pretty the same. However, we are now wondering whether if we combine together, since these are two steps that are separated uh, between each other, if we try to combine unsuper unsupervised with the supervised approaches, we are able to further improve the performance starting from the uh, Mielo DMDS data that we know that are uh, characterized by uh, heterogeneous group of hematopoietic stem cell disorders and it's very tough to find out a good representation of uh, the data. So what we are testing now is a new framework based on neural networks that tries uh, to predict the patient's prognosis and at the same time identify genetic-based cluster of disease. What it does is try to perform a first neural network on the genetic data, where it learn, the models learn a sort of latent representation of the genetic uh, data and then combine uh, this data with the clinical features uh, in order to feed uh, another neural network-based approach uh, for the survival analysis. 
And the results that we obtain are quite encouraging because uh, uh, we can see uh, clusters that are well characterized since they are able to uh, identify specific groups of mutations in the patients and also uh, the groups of patients identified shows different uh, um, profiles uh, in terms of uh, survival probabilities. Another uh, challenge that uh, we, on which are working on uh, is uh, making all uh, these uh, uh, models explainable because uh, um, usually in clinics, uh, machine learning is not uh, well viewed because uh, uh, compared to the statistical approaches, uh, uh, it's tough to find a good uh, uh, interpretability of the features. But uh, also for this, uh, for this point, uh, there are new approaches uh, that enable uh, to clearly show which features are impacting most uh, on the final model. And also we are able uh, for each patient uh, separately, we can also list uh, the features uh, that best represent the prognosis of that patient. So this is a powerful tool that we are trying to integrate in our frameworks. The next step of our work is to extend this analysis also to the other use cases. So for sickle cell disease, uh, uh, we will soon have uh, the genetic information, metabolomic information and clinical data. And in addition, we also have uh, the radiomic uh, features uh, from uh, 1000 patients uh, while uh, for the multiple myeloma, we will have uh, radiomics, uh, uh, copy number variance information, and clinical features. Of course, uh, all these frameworks uh, will be then uh, adapted to uh, federated learning uh, approaches that allows uh, the distribution of the models across multiple centers, and that uh, now pr Patricia will talk about. I would like... Uh, Lastly, to thank uh, all the collaborators of my lab, so Piero Fariselli and Cesare Rollo. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Tiziana. So I can ask now Patricia to take the floor. Okay, so first of all, hello everyone, and thank you for attending our webinars today. As Mariangela already said, I'm Patricia Alonso, I'm professor and researcher at the Universidad Politecnica de Madrid in Spain, and I'm currently finishing my PhD in machine learning techniques applied to the medical field. I'm actually an engineer, so my background is mainly technical, but for a few years we have been observing that there is like a really big opportunity um, to offer our technical knowledge in this field. Sorry for my voice, I'm a little bit ill. Um, in the Genomet for All project uh, in the UPM, in our uh, uh, work package, we are in charge of implementing several machine learning methods in federated environments. So uh, basically, we are trying to solve specific tasks, as Tiziana already said, for example, survival analysis in three different diseases three different rare diseases, but in a federated environment. So this is what uh, why I'm here today. This is what I'm going to talk about today. In addition to trying to explain like the basic, basic concepts of federated learning, I will try to put you in context by showing some preliminary results of what we have been achieving in the project for those rare diseases. So. I will try to be as clear as possible, and I will try to avoid any technicalities. But of course, if there is something that you don't understand, I will be more than happy to try to answer uh, your questions during the question time slot. Okay. So for those of you who are not familiar with the concept, I would like to pose so, an idea or a question that may have come to your, may have crossed your mind at some point. So um, have you ever wished like, uh, that um, medical care was a little bit more personalized or, and therefore more effective or even simpler? Have you ever wanted medical research to advance faster? 
I think that all of us gathered here today, patients, professionals, health enthusiasts like myself, uh, we all agree. I mean, like two or three years ago, I think that idea passed through our minds during COVID time. So I think we all might agree on that. The faster we can develop and validate treatments, new treatments and or new interventions or new medicines, the more lives we can potentially save. So we all know that um, medical, that medicine is in a constantly evolving uh, field driven by technological and scientific uh, advances that seek to, to provide more precise and more personalized medical care. In this context, federated learning presents itself as a tool an essential tool, not only to improve efficiency in medical care, but also to address different challenges, for example, in handling sensitive data. I have gathered those uh, challenges that I consider most important in the next slide, and I will try to clarify them. So the first one, uh, I have already mentioned it, um, and I think it's the first one that comes to our mind when thinking about federated learning is data privacy. Protecting the privacy of a patient is a must, is a priority in the medical field. Traditionally, sharing medical data for research was a little bit risky process because it could expose confidential information about the patient or about the hospital or about the research center. Federated learning allows data to remain on local devices, on local places, on a single hospital, the hospital where the data was generated, without the need to be transferred to a central server or to another hospital. This way, security and privacy risks um, are mitigated. Completely related to this challenge, uh, we have the next one, which is global collaboration. In an increasingly interconnected world as uh, we live in, um, global collaboration has become essential to advance in any field of research, but of course, mainly in medical research. Federated learning allows institutions around the, wor uh, around the world to um, work collaboratively in data analysis without the need to share information. This speeds up a lot uh, the research process and therefore leads to faster medical discoveries, for example. And thanks to these two concepts, these two challenges, federated learning is able to personalize treatments. I don't think this is like a direct challenge for federated learning, but it is a direct consequence of uh, federated learning. Um, each patient is unique with a combination of genetic, medical, um, environmental, lifestyle factors influencing their health. Therefore, I think we all know about this, there is no such thing as um, all the patients responding in the same way to a generic treatment. How does federated learning address this? Well, thanks to the collaboration that I already uh, defines uh, of different institutions ar around the world, we can have a much larger study of cases of patients um, with the same disease, for example, but with very various clinical medical histories. In this way, a professional or a clinician can achieve a more personalized treatment. The next challenge um, would be accelerating the research. Uh, I think we all know, and I have, uh, I've been getting used to this uh, for the past years, medical research is often blocked uh, by the lack of access to data, maybe because of privacy or simply because there are not enough samples to create a big data set. Federated learning overcomes this uh, challenge by allowing access to globally distributed information, not about uh, not uh, globally distributed data, but information. I'll talk about this later. 
and uh, driving research and treatment uh, development faster than ever. And finally, the last challenge that uh, it's always uh, described in the implementation, development, or research of any technology is the cost. By removing the need to transfer data to a central server, federated learning decreases costs associated to, for example, storing or managing medical data. This makes medical research more accessible to all of us. And uh, well, I think that these challenges are remarkable to try to make you see the motivation in using this type of learning in the medical environment. But despite giving you the reasons to believe in federated learning, I have not yet explained what uh, federated learning is. So uh, what um, is the process that, for example, an AI model follows in a federated environment? In this next um, slide, I have written a possible definition of federated learning. Federated learning is a decentralized machine learning approach that enables models on distributed data um, without the need for data, data sharing with bringing privacy and scalability benefits to the field of AI. There are lots of uh, federated learning um, definitions. I took this one because I think it's a, a clear one. But let's take it one step at a time. So the first part, federated learning is a decentralized machine learning approach. What does this mean? Um, well, it refers to, the, um, to an approach where instead of having all the data stored and processed in a single location, in this decentralized approach, the data is kept in the hospitals or centers where it was generated, as I said before. This allows the machine learning model, the AI model to be trained at each location without moving the data. But how do you achieve information sharing without moving the data? That's the key question of a federated learning. I haven't been thinking of a, of a way of explaining the process without going into much depth. And I thought that the following example um, is easy to understand because I think it will sound familiar to all of us. Imagine that there is a group of people who want to, uh, um, to work together on a project, our case, but each of them has valuable information that they don't want to share publicly. Uh, I would think that the process would have like the following steps. First, people meet and agree to work uh, together on the project without having to share all the details of their information. That's the basis. Then each person would do their own analysis with their own data separately from the other ones. As the project progresses, every X time, every, I don't know, two weeks, for example, people will meet um, to share what they have learned, but not what, uh, to share their data. They share updates and conclusions of what they are learning, okay? Not the data. Then based on the shared updates from every person working in the group, the group collaboratively uh, works on making a global solution um, where each update helps making this solution more accurate, okay? And then finally, uh, after lots of meetings uh, working the same way, um, at the end of the project, uh, we useful uh, results will be uh, obtained uh, without the need of having to expose their own personal data. This is exactly what would happen in a real situation where several hospitals work to improve uh, their models, but without sharing sensitive information about the patient. Each one trains its tool, let's call it tool or model, with its own data and every X amount of time, information about how the tool is performing is shared, but not about the data, just information about the, how the model is performing. With this shared information, what would be um, a global tool, a global model is generated and it is improved 
thanks to the information from each uh, update, local update. And then learning can continue from there. This is um, exactly what uh, the slide um, uh, illustrates, this, this figure to, uh, taken from NVIDIA. Um, but I think that's enough explanation. I don't want to go into more technicalities of, so for example, AI algorithms or how the communication between the different locations uh, works. But I hope that like the idea is clear for you. Data is not shared. Information about the tool, about how the tool is working is shared, okay? So uh, before going into, into examples of uh, what we have been achieving in the project so far, I would like to uh, comment briefly that although this learning technique sounds very promising, it is not open sailing. Federated learning presents uh, challenges that need to be properly addressed, especially with regard to the following factors that I have written down in the slides, privacy and security, communication, bandwidth, model coordination, data heterogeneity, latency, etc. How do we ensure that um, our data is secure while training these models? Or how can we make communication between the different devices safe? Or how do we ensure that um, the, um, the devices are synchronized? And finally, a, a more simple one, how can we evaluate a model without having the data? These are questions that we uh, that need to be answered. So to address these challenges, uh, a, a really careful approach to the design and implementation of federated learning systems is really, really essential. Um, I mean, what I want, uh, the idea that I want you to get is that um, it's not all nice and simple. There is a, a lot of hard work behind the design of federated systems in which lots of factors have to be taken into account, okay? So finally, uh, I wanted to show you the progress of um, how the use of federated learning for several tasks using AI models is benefiting our experiments. So far, we, um, we have only obtained data, well, we have only obtained results for two diseases, for the MDS one and for the multiple myeloma, the MM1. So in this slide, I'm showing you results for the first one, for the MDS. Um, just a brief explanation. I have used a, a we have a, used a AI, a deep learning model, just as Tiziana showed you the by framework. It's a similar one. We have a, used that model a training with the MDS data, which again, um, it's a really, really uh, high dimensional data set and it has um, really heter heterogeneous data. So it's a complicated data set to train a model. We have performed survival time analysis for MDS and we have validated our results in terms of C index. As Tiziana said, the higher the C index value, the better. And in these experiments, we wanted to simulate a real life situation in which three different hospitals train uh, each one a local model with their own data. You can see in the, in the slide, instead of hospitals, it says nodes, but the same. So I'm showing you results here for three different experiments. Scenario one is a simulation where every hospital has the same quantity and quality of data. I think it was like 2,000 samples each one. Um, you can see that the curves show a really similar performance for, um, for each uh, hospital, which makes sense since the data is really similar in terms of quantity and quality. Every, you can see that every 20 iterations or every 20 epochs, uh, there is a peak in the representations. This peak represents the federated learning um, sharing step, okay? Once the local information from the learning process, um, oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> I, um, once the, yes, once the global information is 
return to each local hospital, these hospitals can start learning from that again. So that's like the, the whole process. Uh, in this scenario, you can see that federated learning does not help at, at all, but because the hospitals have the same quantity and quality of data and because of the data set it, itself. In the um, next uh, two graphs, you can see that there are a, there is a hospital that begins showing a worse performance compared to the other two. This makes sense because this hospital, hospital three, node three, in scenario four is worse than the other ones in terms of quantity and quality of data. You can see that uh, there are two graphs. One is scenario four and 100. That means that uh, the hospital three has 100 samples. And the other one is like a really, really, um, um, how could I say this? Like a, a, the worst, Mm, performance we could obtain because the uh, hospital three has only 10 samples, which is absolutely useless for a deep learning model. So uh, we can confirm watching this, um, the different uh, representations and the different curves that federated learning process helps this node, this hospital to reach the other ones after some iterations. Hospital, uh, well, scenario for 10, 10 samples lasts a little bit more than the other one, but because it has less information. So every time um, model information is being shared, it um, achieves a little bit better uh, performance, okay? So we can confirm here that federated learning works somehow helping the worst hospital, the worst location, uh, the worst performance, um, to achieve better results. So uh, the next um, slide, in this slide, I'm showing you numer uh, numerical results, not graphical, for the other use case. I thought that maybe numerical results were um, more easy to, 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 to explain, of course. And in this case, we have, um, well, for this data set, we have performed a classification task, not survival analysis task. In terms of early relapse, whether the patient achieved or not the early relapse. Uh, in this case, we have uh, used a different model. It's just a logistic regression model used to classify. And the data set itself is a data set with a really few, really few samples. And you can see that it is um, we have divided the results in terms of therapy because the patients are divided in terms of therapy. Okay, so uh, in this case, we have uh, used a, a metric called F1 score, and the higher this score is, the better. So um, we can confirm that uh, training in an isolated, isolated way, which is a, a way where, no, where there is no federated learning, there is no in, uh, sharing information. This way, um, we obtain worse results than sharing information. For example, if we focus on a scenario three, where um, there are two hospitals uh, that have similar quantity of data, and the third one, again, has only 10 samples, the results obtained in an iso isolated way are lower for the third one. But once information is shared, the results improve a lot. So, this is all I wanted to show you today. I hope that at least you go back home with like the idea of what federated learning environments are. And of course, with the idea that this kind of learning improves models performance in some situations, for example, where um, data, um, where uh, there is a scarcity in quantity of samples or there is poor quality of the data. And I think that this is uh, something that uh, can be extended to the real world. It real, uh, really happens in real world. So these preliminary results are really, really interesting. I also wanted to highlight uh, before ending that although I have focused on the, in the medical field due to the people we are gathered here and the nature of the project, this kind of learning can be applied to any other field. So it's a really, really interesting uh, learning process. And 
I think that's all from my side. So thank you very much for listening. I hope that it was not that boring and I, I hope that I have shown you in some way what a federated implementation is capable of helping in the medical field. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Patricia. And it was very comprehensive and clear. So now I will pass the floor to the last speaker, Gastone. Okay, good morning. Okay, my name is uh, Gastone Castellani. I'm in charge of uh, Work Package 6, uh, that is uh, the artificial intelligence. And uh, yeah, in the European project uh, Genomed for All, I will give you an uh, introduction, a uh, panorama about the data integration and some analysis. In Genomed for All, we have three use cases. That is uh, multiple myeloma, myelodysplastic syndrome, and uh, sickle cell disease. And uh, the type of data we are collecting uh, in this project are dependent from the use case. For example, in the case of multiple myeloma, we will have uh, some uh, genomic measurements, uh, especially copy number variation and uh, medical imaging uh, measurements uh, like uh, CT, computerized tomography, and uh, PET, that is a positron emission tomography, because uh, this uh, technique has been proved to be very useful in the diagnosis of uh, multiple myeloma and also in the stratification of patients. In the case of myelodysplastic syndrome, we have basically uh, genomic and clinical data. Of course, also in the multiple myeloma use case, we have clinical data. In myelodysplastic syndrome, we have basically target sequencing and uh, clinical, uh, clinical data, clinical measurement. In the case of sickle cell, we have uh, medical imaging data, basically magnetic resonance and uh, metabolomic and uh, uh, and uh, another type of uh, genomic data that is, uh, uh, I don't remember the name, but is a kind of uh, uh, not copy number variation, but is uh, uh, a kind of array for some uh, mutation in, uh, in uh, sickle cell. So I like to start with this slide because uh, this is a famous motto from uh, this guy that was a statistician or a data scientist, might be the first data scientist uh, in the 50s. And we are very dependent from data. Without data, it's not possible to do anything. Of course, we will need also to aggregate, uh, to integrate uh, this data, but uh, the first ingredient is uh, to have data and the data with a with a good quality. I have to I have to mention also Harmony, that is a project, uh, another European project uh, that is uh, studying oncomatological diseases. And uh, Genomed for All actually is collaborating with Harmony. Harmony is a, uh, I think, is the is the biggest, the biggest uh, project in the world about uh, onco-hematological diseases. Uh, this, is a, this is a first idea of uh, uh, data integration. So we have data from different, from different layer of complexity, starting from the molecular layer, and so metabolomic, uh, genomic, uh, et cetera. And uh, across this layer of complexity, we can reach also the medical imaging. Actually, we have also uh, cytogenetic, uh, cytological and histopathological images, and we are working in the integration of this layer. There are several methods for integrating this data. Now, I don't want to, to describe in detail this method, but uh, in this slide, you can see what is called a multiplex. A multiplex is a generalization of complex network. 
And so each layer can be analyzed with technique more with by complex network. And we can have also intralayer connection. So basically connection between different layer of uh, complexity. There are also other methods for uh, data integration. I will discuss just uh, multiple myeloma in which we are trying to, to integrate uh, the radiomic approach with the uh, genomic approach. As Patricia was uh, saying, uh, Genomed for All, one of the pillar of uh, Genomed for All is uh, the federated learning. And I don't want to spend uh, time in describing federated learning. I can just say that federated learning is a way to overcome the problem of uh, data sharing. So we hope that federated learning can help to have a kind of uh, open data, open space. So basically, as Patricia was saying, we are moving the algorithm, not the data. Okay, this is a, uh, a pipeline that can be used also for data integration. This is one of the simplest data integration because in the case of uh, myelodysplastic syndrome, we can integrate between genomic variable and cytogenetic variable. What, has these two, what are these two variables? Genomic variables uh, list of mutation in well-known gene. So this is called target sequencing. So expert in oncohematology selected a number of genes that can be relevant for the diagnosis and the stratification of patients. This is true for MDS, for myelodysplastic syndrome, but this is also true for uh, acute, acute myeloid leukemia. By the way, myelodysplastic syndrome in the worst scenario can generate acute myeloid leukemia. So it's very important also to, to be able to predict the transition from myelodysplastic syndrome to leukemia. So genomic variable and the other variable that we can integrate are cytogenetic variable. Cytogenetic variables are, let's say, mutation on a larger scale. So uh, deletion, insertion, duplication, etc. A lot of these mutations are important in the diagnosis of myelodysplastic syndrome, but also in uh, acute myeloid leukemia and also other diseases. And of course, we have also clinical variables. A similar approach can be used also for multiple myeloma. And in the case of multiple myeloma, we have to use a copy number variation. So basically some region in the genome can be amplified or uh, we can have amplification or a deletion of uh, some region. So basically this pipeline that can be also implemented in, <clears throat> in uh, a federated way uh, is uh, clustering. So clustering means to stratify patient, to identify this cluster. And after this uh, stratification, we assign patient to each cluster of mutation and cytogenetic alteration. After this step, we can compute, for example, some clinical outcome. In this slide, I'm illustrating a typical clinical outcome that can be overall survival or progression-free survival, etc. And I think that uh, Tipiana was showing some uh, 
very advanced technique for, for performing this analysis. So clustering, patients, and computing of some clinical outcome. We can also, by using Bayesian network, and Bayesian network can be also implemented in a federated way, we can assess the, causal, the causality between uh, mutation. So if one mutation is causing the insources of another mutation, et cetera. And finally, also we can uh, assess about the, the temporal um, scale of this mutation. This is called Bradley Terry, Bradley, Ter Bradley Terry test. So this is a very generic uh, pipeline uh, for genomic variable. In the case of radiomics, the idea is very similar. Is in some sense a similar. So if we have uh, medical images, so PET, CT, TAC, etc., we can, after a segmentation, after the identifica identification of a region of interest, we can segment this region, and from this region, we can extract feature. This feature can be morphological and can be a texture feature. Uh, by using uh, a doc software, we can extract, uh, let's say, uh, a thousand of this feature. We can also extract uh, this feature by using uh, a convolutional neural network, a multi-layer network. And after this feature extraction, we need to perform feature extraction and dimensionality reduction. So basically we have to identify the most important feature for predicting some clinical outcome. The clinical outcome can be, as in this case, response to therapy, uh, overall survival, progression-free survival. This is depending from the, from the desiderata of the clinicians. But the problem from a, from a computational point of view is very similar to the problem we described in the case of uh, genomic data. So we have tabular data, the rows are the patients, and the column are the feature, and we want to use this feature after feature selection and dimensionality reduction, we want to predict some clinical outcome. Uh, yeah, this is a, a pipeline. I, I don't want to, to describe, uh, I don't want to describe all this pipeline. Uh, this can be used for uh, two use cases, myelodysplastic syndrome and multiple myeloma. Let's say for the part related to genomic data in multiple myeloma. So let me just describe the the most important the most important step. One of the most important step, in my opinion, is the dimensionality reduction. Because uh, uh, if, uh, if you want to use also a simple model, a logistic regression or a perceptron or a simple artificial intelligence model, you have to reduce the complexity of the data. And this complexity can be reduced by using a dimensionality reduction. Basically, dimensionality reduction is a way to identify the most important feature capable to predict the, the clinical outcome. And uh, another important step is the clustering. For the clustering, there are several methods. Uh, some methods are easy to 
be federated. Other methods are not so easy to be federated. And uh, so we are still working on this uh, trade-off because our gold standard is a method that is not, uh, is not easy to, to, to implement in a federated way, but there are other methods that can be implemented in a federated way. And so we are trying to, to compare their results. Uh, okay, I think, uh, yes, I, I forgot, I forgot, uh, but it's written here, another very important, po another very important problem for data analytics, but also for data integration is the missingness and the quality of data. Usually in uh, every clinical uh, data set, we have a missing data for a lot of reason, because a patient uh, uh, don't finish the study or there are, so it's very important also to, to correct the data for the missingness. And there are uh, procedures that are called imputation procedure that can impute the missing data. But this is a, this is a very important this is a very important problem that is related to the quality of data. And also EMA is very is very interested in approaches for uh, impute data in a very efficient way. This is another pipeline for radiomic. Actually, we implemented this pipeline in Genomed for All. Uh, basically, also this pipeline is uh, concerning about uh, pre-processing of images. In the case of imaging data, we have to perform a heavy pre-processing. So the noising, registration, etc., segmentation, etc. And after this, a first feature extraction by software and ad hoc method. And after this feature extraction, dimensionality reduction, clustering, and prediction. So this is one example in the case of multiple myeloma. This is one exam example on how we integrate a different measurement. So in the case of multiple myeloma, PET is, uh, is a very important technique because PET is capable to identify the uh, region with a high metabolic activity. But in order to localize this region, we have to merge and to align PET images with uh, CT images because PET is just a functional procedure and is not giving you information about the anatomy of the patient. So we have to over, overlap PET and CT. This is one example of segmentation of a CT scan. And this has been performed in collaboration with UPM, with the group, actually with the group of Federico Alvarez. They are using a particular software that is called Moose, and we are comparing results with uh, another method developed by, by our group. And uh, this is the overlapping between PET and CT. So you can see that there are some regions that are very active from a metabolic point of view, the brain, the liver, etc. But we are interested in lesion near to the spinal cord because these, les these lesions has been classified by a, a medical doctor as lesions that are very important for predicting the outcome. And so we performed a method to identify automatically these kind of uh, regions. 
and uh, this is a preliminary result. PM means perimedullar lesion. So if there is an involvement of this lesion, the survival is uh, lower. And so this is a first result. This is just a couple of major curves. So we hope in the future to use also other, other more refined method. But this is just an indication that the involvement of this lesion or the identification of this lesion is very important. Another example uh, is uh, the identification of uh, silent infarct region in a sickle cell disease patients. So in this case, we have uh, MRI images and you see these white matter hyperintense region are these small regions that are also very difficult to identify by eyes. So in collaboration with the University of Padova, we generate, we use the software that has been used in the case of uh, multiple sclerosis. And uh, this uh, software, after the supervision of an ex expert uh, radiologist, uh, neuroradiologist, was able to identify this region. And you see that we have also to post-process the images because the ventricular area are identified as possible white matter hyperintense region. So we have to uh, eliminate this false positive. But now the results are enough good. So this, after this identification, feature extraction, and uh, we repeat the, 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 the pipeline I was showing. So just to finish, this is, uh, uh, let's say, the idea, the long-term vision. So by using uh, this uh, multidimensional and multi-omic data, we will be able to extract feature in a federated way to integrate this feature and to build a surrogate model that can be a kind of a digital twin that can be useful for diagnosis, prognosis, hopefully therapy, etc. And thank you, and this is all. Thank you very much, Gastone, for this presentation. So now we have as announced more or less 20 minutes for the discussion. So I see there are already questions in the chat, uh, but I will ask first my colleague from Australo to check in the Slido if... There we go, yeah. Thank you. So the um, first one, do you envision patients will also have access to IE healthcare tools in the future? For example, for self-monitoring their disease at home? Thank you. Who wants to pick this big question? <laughs> Who is brave enough? <laughs> no, I can I can say something, but mm -hmm. this is not related to Genomed for All. Please, please. So, I mean, yeah, you are no, experts, so... so we accept every answer. <laughs> No, no, uh, one, just one example, uh, classical self-monitoring can be obtained by a technique that is called photoplethysmography. Photoplethysmography is a technique that is capable to, to give a surrogate of, uh, of uh, electrocardiogram, but also can inform you about the state the elastic state of uh, arteries. So by using uh, artificial intelligence, but also statistical learning, you can assess the so-called vascular age. The vascular age is different from the chronological age because in some individuals, as a function of diet and lifestyle, etc., the aging process 
in the vascular system can be different from the, chronolo from the chronological age. And so a quantification of uh, vascular age can be performed at home automatically, etc. Otherwise, uh, some artificial intelligence uh, software can also collect the self-reported outcome. And so patients can inform the software and the medical doctors about their state, etc. So all the method based on sensor, on wearable, can be used for this at home. Thank you. So if Patricia and Tiziana do not want to add anything on this question, I will go to the second one, but please stop me if you want to add anything. So um, heterogeneity was mentioned as a challenge in federating learning. In rare diseases, will data fragmentation also have a negative effect on results? Thanks. Okay, so I think that data fragmentation is going to have negative effects in not in federated learning itself, but in in the use of any mo AI model, any machine learning model. The data has to be really good pre-processed so that the AI model works. Of course, if um, the quality of the data is not that good, uh, the AI model won't work uh, the best and the federated learning will be useless. So as Gastone said, um, any model, any machine learning model depends on data, on how data is um, stored, how it is pre-processed, where it is pre-processed. So I think it will also have negative effects. It has to be um, the previous step to uh, the federated learning part has to be uh, the best, um, really well organized and really clear so that the federated learning process makes sense. So, uh, I mean, I think it, it will have a negative effect on the results. I don't know if maybe Tiziana wants to add something if they might know more about data fragmentation. No, but you are the expert of federated learning, <laughs> Patricia. So I leave I leave the the floor to you. <laughs> okay, so we we'll go to the next question. Regarding federated learning, should the hospital provide which variables are in their file in order for the developer to simulate similar data? What does simulate similar data mean? I mean, um, I think that, uh, well, the hospital can, if, if there are legal or privacy concerns, the hospital won't, um, won't share at all the content of the, of the data itself. So, there is a problem there because if some hospitals have some, for example, some variables refer to some experiments, but the other hospital has other variables uh, refer to other experiments, the model itself um, will, I think it will crash when trying to aggregate the updates. So this is like, um, I don't know how to, to explain this. Um, Oof, I don't know how to explain this. Uh, I think that in the hospital, I don't know if Gastonia was going to say something. Uh, 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 I don't know. No, no, yes. Uh, sorry, Patricia. Okay. Um, I mean, the hospital is not going to share the information about the data set, and that uh, concerns the variables itself, uh, their, themselves, of course. But there has to be like... Um, general model where the uh, local updates are aggregated that can be um, scalable to many variables 
Yeah, I don't know if this makes sense. Now the only the only that I can add about the simulate similar data is uh, synthetic data generation. Mm -hmm. So it is possible also by using the real data as a template to generate data that are called synthetic data with the same statistical properties of the original data. And these can be used for training uh, a neural network and or artificial mm. intelligence models. Mm. The results that I showed in the um, presentation, they, they were obtained with artificial, with simulated data. Since we have a uh, really few samples for each data set, really few regarding the deep learning model, of course. Since we have a uh, really few data, uh, we simulated new data, but that is done in a local device that is not uh, federated, that is not shared. Okay, that's everything I can say. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so I move to the next one. About the shift from a centralized to a federated implementation, does quality matter more than quantity? For instance, fewer HQ samples are preferable than high quality samples are preferable than? It depends more on the type of model you are using, not on the federated implementation, I think. The kind of model that you are using can be more sensible to the quantity or to the quality of the data. So it depends more on the model. There are models that can work with few samples, but if the quality of the data is really poor, for example, there are lots of missing um, data from X variables, uh, the model can work really bad. It depends on the model, not on the, um, on the federated implementation. Uh, of course, if you have few samples and the quality is really poor, then it's really difficult for a general model to work. But it does not really depend on the federated implementation. Thank you. Does Gastone or Tiziana want to add anything? Or I will move to the other question. So the um oh sorry. The the benefit of the FL approach are clear in terms of performance only. How does the FL model compare with a centralized one that will use the whole data set? Um, the, uh, the aim of the FL implementation is to achieve the more or less the same results as a, as a, a centralized one with the whole da data set. So that's the comparison. The aim of the FL uh, system is to achieve what a, a centralized system with the best quality and higher quantity of data could um could manage so that's what we are trying the the thing is that uh, when trying to to explain our results uh, we try to compare them to the to something we call the uh, upper bound which is a centralized uh, model with the whole data set so that's our aim of course it's depending on the model and on the data in each um different hospital, for example, it's really difficult to achieve that upper bound, but that's what we are trying to, to do. Thank you. So I will go to the next question for Tiziana. What is your approach to select the most su su suitable co-founding factors for the survival model, apart from age sex? Thank you. Yeah, that is a good point. Uh, so there are different types of approaches uh, that uh, we can uh, consider. So there are some uh, models uh, like uh, the penalized regression models uh, that uh, allows uh, to uh, estimate also uh, the weights uh, in a way that uh, we directly perform uh, the feature selection because uh, some weights uh, that are uh, 
uh, estimated from the models uh, can be uh, zero. So putting into zero the, the weight of that specific feature, we can automatically perform uh, the feature selection. Otherwise, with other methods that in any case estimate uh, tries to give uh, also a minimal score to the feature, we can uh, um, uh, complicate more the uh, training phase by doing further cross validations that allows to find the best set of features uh, that performs uh, uh, the best for the training data. And of course, uh, we, we hope that in the test data, they can perform uh, as well as uh, best. Um, one point, we need to be um, very careful in this type of operation because uh, since uh, we need to increase uh, the steps uh, in the cross validation uh, and uh, if we have uh, not so much, not so many data available, uh, there is uh, the risk uh, to have uh, a sort of overfitting of the model. What I mean? Uh, it means uh, that the model uh, is, uh, it fits uh, too well uh, on the data that uh, we are uh, considering uh, both for training and for test. Uh, and uh, if in the future we have uh, to use that model again in another uh, court, uh, we do not uh, achieve the same results. Uh, that means that the model is uh, too fit to that specific uh, type of data. Um, yes, I think I, I said all the, the main, the major points related to the feature selection, but uh, if there are some questions, uh, let me know. Thank you very much. Um, so next question. Yes, I see we have more or less five minutes. So quality of data has been a concern for some data of the artificial intelligence funded project. What advice can you give data providers for future participation? I think I think uh, I think I can answer this. Uh, the first, uh, the first uh, to the to the data provider, the first hint is about uh, to fulfill the the request from the from the from the people that are uh, trying to standardize this data because so for example uh, be sure that uh, the outcome the clinical outcome has the minimum or as is possible the minimum missingness rate and uh, the other hint is to check the missingness mechanism if it's random or not at random and uh, yeah and of course uh, try to provide uh, data with uh, the with the minimum percentage of uh, missing data uh, also check about the quality about the measurements how the measurements are expressed etc but in general in all the European projects, there are some standards that are that are, have to fulfill. So the golden rule is try to fulfill the standard that the project is uh, is asking. I would like to add one thing to what Gaston has said. The of course, the, if there is a standard, just follow that. But a uh, one thing that I have a uh, I have encountered a lot is the dimensionality of the data. There are uh, sometimes if, if you have few few samples, few patients, and you have lots of, uh, let's say if you have a C as a V, you have lots of columns of variables if, and, and really few samples, that won't work in an AI model, in a deep learning model. You have to reduce as much as you can the dimensionality, maybe try and, and leave the main variables that are most important for what task uh, we are going to perform. So the dimensionality is a really important factor. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Um, so I will pick the very last question. Um, what is Bayesian network? I don't know if I pronounce it. It's not a one minute question <laughs> answer, oh, no. I guess, from no, no, your expression. A, uh, so very, <laughs> very, very quickly, a Bayesian network is a graphical probabilistic model in which uh, the, condi the conditional probabilities are setting the links between uh, between nodes. And so by using this conditional probability, you can assess ab about the causal relationship between object, let's say mutation or other object. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry we cannot tackle all the questions, but it's a good sign because it means that it was really unnecessary and crucial topic to be tackled by a webinar. Um, so what, what can I say? Thank you very much to the three experts with us sharing all their expertise and also the time with us. That's very much uh, appreciated. And thanks for the audience for this incredible interactive debate and also to my colleagues of Australia and Genomet for All for coordinating all of that. So this was the last uh, session of a program for public at large. Thanks, really thank you a lot. And um, videos will be soon available on YouTube of the four cycle of webinars. So have a nice evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> bye. 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 Thank you very bye. Much. bye. bye.